vocally <laughs> but you know what it doesn't matter we're praising God we're giving praise to him we're giving worship to him the only one who is our firm foundation who never lets us down who will always be there we can always put our trust in him in times where we we feel that we're on our own we're not. He's with us. He is our firm foundation. Through all the trials, through anything we go through. Because in life, we do have ups and downs. That's just what it is. But he's always there with us. Always.
is there with us. He is our firm foundation. Christ is our firm foundation. The rock on which I stand when everything around me shaking. Oh, I'm never So why would he fail now? He won't. Yeah, my God will fail. Well, I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going on.
God won't fail. He won't fail. He won't fail. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind.
that's adequate, Lord, um, to thank you for uh, an unconditional love that we could never earn or merit, um, that we could never win by our own means. We praise you, Father. Thank you for sending your son, for adopting us into your family um, and continuing to chase us down. Even as we are faithless, Lord, you are faithful still. Would you root us in your love this morning? We ask that you would make us to know your love in a new way that would uh, define us more than anything else that is true about us, Lord. We trust you. We love you. We thank you. In your name, Jesus, amen. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us this morning. It's so great to see you all. You can go ahead and have a seat. We hope you enjoy the rest of our service. We've got some announcements for you, so check out the screens. Hello, my name is Emily and I help on our photography team. I'm a mom of three beautiful kids and I love my golden doodle named Sunny. And I'm here to deliver your Kessid news. One of the expressions of worship here at Kessid is through our tithes and offerings. We have many ways to give, like our giving boxes, kiosks in the lobby, text to give, and our church app. Thank you for your continued generosity. We are excited for our Worship in the Round Night coming February 5th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. We'll have an amazing time of singing, reflection, communion, and baptism available. There will be childcare for ages three and up. We hope to see you there. Are you looking to meet people in our church community? Check out our meetups. Meetups are small gatherings hosted by people at Kesed that bring us together around something that we love, like crafting, hiking, serving, biking, crocheting, baking, cooking, etc. Go to the app or website to view our list of meetups and learn how you can host one at kesed.com meetups. The details and registration for all of these events will be on your church app, which is available for download on the App Store and Google Play, on our website under the events page, on our social media, or you can come to the Welcome Center at any of our in-person services. Thanks again so much for joining us here at Kesset. Please take the next few minutes and stand up and say hello to someone around you. And we'll continue with our service shortly. Good morning, welcome to Kessid. I'm, uh, I'm so glad you're here. If you are new, thanks for coming. My name's Danny, I'm gonna be sharing with you today. I am one of the pastors here. Uh, I just wanna get something out of the way right out the top. Uh, Chandra and I did not intentionally match outfits today. That was all the Holy Spirit, so I just want you to know that. Uh, I don't know what's going on there, but uh, uh, she walked in and I was like, why, why? And so it's just, um, listen, uh, we're in a church series right now, and this particular talk out of the series I think is going to be the most uh, maybe awkward for some of you because today we're going to talk about church trauma, uh, church pain. You may even say in some cases church abuse. And I recognize, especially in our early service, that uh, this is uh, probably a lot of people that, that grew up going to church. And you, you may not have some of the things that we're going to talk about today, or you may have a bunch of the stuff we're going to talk about today, but have never really let yourself sit with it. And so my hope is that, uh, that, that, you're, that you're curious with me about this kind of conversation that we're about to have, because uh, Thursday night was just incredible. Uh, I don't know if it's because it's all the folks who don't go to church on the weekends because they got issues with church, and so we were able to meet them in that space. I have no idea. Uh, it's all the weird church people on Thursdays. Um, uh, and, and I think 11 is going to be a ton of visitors, a ton of people that are kind of curious about church and maybe came off and on. But this service, I'm just, I'm just going to create space for whoever's watching online or you in the room right now 
that uh, this service, I'm not sure how it's going to hit, and I'm, I'm going for it anyways, because I think there's a lot of healing that can be had when we face trauma, and not just in our church life, but in our personal lives as well. So uh, that's my hope. I think it's going to be really powerful, and uh, I think you'll uh, probably not enjoy it. So let's get started. Uh, let me give you a working definition of trauma. This is uh, a, the, Trauma, by the way, is not specific to church. So all of this trauma information that I'm going to give you right now uh, is for you in all areas of your life and also for the people that you love. So working definition of trauma. Trauma is experience or environments that are emotionally painful and distressing that overwhelm or exhaust our ability to cope. And so there are things that overrun us things that cause us to feel like, like we don't have the ability to uh, change or defer the outcome. The word trauma derives from the Greek word trauma, which actually means to wound or pierce. Traumatic events involve perceived threats to life, bodily integrity, psychological safety, and personal dignity are all things you can kind of categorize inside the trauma category. They include losses over which we have no control. They are disruptive to healthy development, especially if they happen early on in our childhoods or early on in our spiritual development, even if we're older. Circumstances of a traumatic event often include any range of experiences from abuse of power, betrayal of trust, entrapment, helplessness, pain, confusion, loss, and, and so on. And this is what trauma does. Trauma basically, I'll put this on the screen, throws us off balance, and we often respond by reacting or reenacting to the direction of or completely away from the trauma that has happened. So for example, you usually in a traumatic experience either react or reenact the trauma that has happened to you. When we react, that means that we live in opposition to trauma. So this is growing up with an alcoholic parent, and so we react by never tasting or drinking alcohol ever in our lives and proclaiming that everything to do with alcohol is dangerous and no one should do it ever. That would be a reaction to the trauma of experiencing uh, maybe an alcoholic parent. In the same way, we can also reenact we can actually have siblings in the same family where they grew up under the same alcoholic parents and one of them reacts by never drinking and the other one reenacts by always drinking, trying to overcome and repeat the trauma that happened to them in their story, basically in order to gain mastery. So often in our lives, we don't even know it, but we are reacting to trauma that's happened to us or we, or we are reenacting to trauma that's happened to us. I can guarantee this, psychologically, the greater the intensity of our reactions, the greater the likelihood that it is connected to our story. And that we, along the way, because of the pain, have proclaimed to the world, either through reenacting or reacting, never again. That will never happen to me again. When you realize this about your own life, uh, you will actually start to be really curious of why you will be triggered, we say, by something. And you'll have this huge surge of response that everyone around you is like, what's going on, man? And, and it happens in some of the strangest situations. And a lot of those situations happen, uncomfortably so, right here in church. People will walk in. They'll see a guy like me on stage. They'll remember something that happened to them in their story, and they will either reenact or react, whatever that was, and oftentimes with me. It took me a while in full-time ministry to realize that sometimes people weren't upset with me when they were incredibly upset with me. And sometimes when I was like really going after something, it took me a while to realize some people should be a little more upset, but they're completely numb and cut off because they're not gonna allow that part of their life to be hurt again. This is why traumatized people expose themselves seemingly and compulsively to situations reminiscent of the original trauma, especially when they are reenacting. And this is natural because one thing is for sure about trauma, and that is to heal a wound, you have to return to it. You cannot heal trauma by just uh, man-upping or woman-upping. You can't just heal trauma by being a big boy or a big girl and just getting over it. All that's going to do is set a foundation in your life that's going to be a little off 
And then you're gonna build a marriage and a story and especially a spiritual life in a direction that you never intended. So today, because we're talking specifically about trauma, uh, we're gonna do just that. We're gonna return to where much of the church's traumatizing began. I think we realized in the beginning that, that God wanted to be our great creator and great best friend and great uh, relational example. But of course, in the garden, Adam and Eve pushed that away. And so humankind from then on was constantly uh, traumatizing one another and, and causing great distress to one another without God as the director of how we were to behave. And so different systems were put in place in order to reconnect humanity to each other and to God. And in the Old Testament, one of those systems was the start of the church with people called priests. And priests were people who stood up in front of people like this and looked at the words of God and prayerfully through accountability with each other and with the people they led said, hey, I think this is some of the ways that, that we should stop abusing each other. The, here's some of the ways that we should start loving each other. And these priests were supposed to be, the Bible says, shepherds. And they were supposed to encourage the flock of people that God asked them to lead. They were supposed to shore up. They were supposed to bind. They were supposed to seek. They were supposed to do all kinds of things that, guess what? They didn't do well. The power went to their heads. They decided they were more special than everybody else. They started taking from the flock instead of helping the flock. And so God did what God does. He sent them a prophet. And oftentimes I enjoy God's prophets because they just don't play games, right? They just roll up and they're like, here's the deal. You suck, you suck, and you suck. And here's how God's going to fix it. It's profound. This is how God likes to work with us, by just being authentic, speaking right to the core. Ezekiel chapter 34 is a prophecy against the religious leaders for using the people of God, also known as the church, instead of serving them. I'm going to pick up in verse 1 all the way through 6. The word of the Lord came to me, says Ezekiel. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Skip to verse 9. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds. And I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. Without a doubt, we can see in this passage that God holds his religious leaders to a very high account. In other words, and this still applies today, the leaders of the church are not above the ways of God, no matter how great they preach. <laughs> I wasn't talking about myself right there, people. That was, that was, Jesus himself teaches this. Jesus himself teaches this exact passage because this is something that will not just go away in the Old Testament. They, uh, it says that Jesus is walking through town and he sees a blind man who was blind from birth and his disciples, always looking for opportunities to learn, start asking questions about this blind man and how the church culture at the time had taught completely ridiculously that this blind man was born from birth because of sin from his parents. And so Jesus, they're talking about this and Jesus is like, no, no, once again, the church leaders have taken something out of context and use it in a wrong way to bring power to themselves. That's not at all what's happening. And then he bends on the ground and then he heals the blind man's eyes. He says, go wash in the pool and you will see. And the blind man goes and washes in the pool and he sees and he starts telling everybody the story. 
And so eventually people go around and they're like, this is amazing, this is a miracle. Let's do what we know to do and bring the blind man to the church where he can be celebrated, where he can be proclaimed clean, where he can be brought back into the fold of his community because he was blind and now he sees. So the church leaders see the blind man and they look at him and they realize he was healed on the Sabbath. Well, that can't be good. And then they realize it wasn't one of them who healed him. Well, that can't be good. And then they realize, wait a minute, this makes our power a little less, and that can't be good. And so they say, you were never blind from birth, you're somebody else. He goes, I don't think so. They say, go get his parents. So they go and drag his parents in, the sinful parents, the one who gave birth to a sinful blind baby. Is this your son? They look at him. I always thought this would be interesting because unless they spoke, he wouldn't even know they were his parents. He was blind from birth. He'd be like, I don't know these people. And they'd have been like, it's me. Oh, mom, that sounds like you. You're what my mom looks like? Whole other interaction not mentioned in the story that I thought would have been amazing. In the end, they say, yes, this is our son, but we have no idea how he now sees. And so they go and get the blind man again and begin to question him. Let's pick it up in John 9, verse 24 and 31. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner, this man being Jesus that healed the blind man. And he answers, the blind man does, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know though, is that I was blind and now I see. This is a beautiful conversation between shepherds and sheep that's about to go completely sideways. This is a sheep saying, listen, somebody showed up and saw me and then brought sight to my eyes. But the church doesn't know what to do with that because it didn't fit within their context of control. And so they begin to question him, verse 26. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Such a disrespectful blind man who now sees, but I'm in it, I dig it. And they reviled him. They reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. There's still a lot of casting out, by the way, that happens in the church today. People who have healings that we just don't understand. People who overcome things that, that, that we don't feel like are the most important things they need to overcome. They need to overcome uh, their ability to, to operate in this lifestyle, but instead they overcome their, their ability to, or their fear about coming into our community. And then they come in and we're like, yeah, 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 that's cool that you feel welcome here and all that. But what about this thing in your lifestyle? What about that? Because that, that doesn't feel like it really fits well with us in our Sunday morning experiences. And so we may not drag people out of the church anymore, but we do a little bit with our eyes and maybe with our ignoring, maybe with our not sitting by them, maybe with our not connecting with them because they just sometimes don't fit well within our context. But this man, this man is the church. This man fits perfectly in the context of Jesus. So Jesus hears that they had cast him out, verse 35, and then he went and looked for him. I always thought that was the most profound part of the story. Jesus heard through the rumor mill. Did you hear what happened to the blind man we healed last Thursday? What, uh, yeah, no, I didn't hear. He went to church, right? Yeah, the church said, you're not welcome here. What? Yeah, the, the church deemed him crazy. Jesus is like, where is he? I don't know, you're God. Why don't you just like, you know, use your mind Google and figure it out. I don't know where he is. <laughs> find him. So they send him out into, and they find him. They find him. He's somewhere probably telling people about Jesus. But remember, the blind man, I love this, the blind man didn't see till after he was healed by Jesus. He was, Jesus put mud on his eyes and said, go wash in the pool. So here's another encounter that the, the man has with someone. He doesn't even know who he is because he hadn't seen him yet. 
So Jesus heard they cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And this guy answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Jesus walked into our world to take what we thought we knew to be certain and turn it completely upside down. That's why always the least is going to be the greatest and the last is going to be first. The blind man and the beggar is going to be the actual example of the church, even though when he walks into the beautiful temple with the beautiful people, they say he doesn't belong. At this point, a crowd is gathered around Jesus as he's pointing out to this blind man who he is. And so Jesus does what Jesus does so well, which is to leverage everything into a sermon, which I do all the time as well, but my wife doesn't appreciate it as much as, <laughs> as these people. <laughs> Verse 7 says, so Jesus again said to them, he's saying to the crowd, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And then he slays them all with this next phrase, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Do you know why this verse slays everybody in the room, especially the Pharisees and Sadducees, the church leaders? Because they would have very much known the prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 34. They would have very much known that, that at that time, the prophet was calling out the bad shepherds. And Jesus is proclaiming in this instance, in a public way, that all of those watching that are part of that system. You are the wicked wicked shepherds of Israel, but I am the good shepherd who comes to rescue. They would have tripped. They would have ran back into their little church huddles and went back into their green rooms and private offices, stood in the circle and said, what are we supposed to do about this guy? He just called us bad shepherds. And Jesus would have moved on to preach many more sermons about the church leadership of his day. He will go on to say this, Matthew chapter 31, verse one, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, listen how offensive this is. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. The Lord is serious about his church leadership. He is serious about his priests and his rabbis and his Sadducees and his pastors. And that's why talking about trauma from the position that I am right now is really, really uncomfortable because I am part of this system and I am under this judgment. And that is as it should be. Now you may hear all this and maybe a little bit of you is like, wow, Danny, that must be really difficult for you. Well, I'm not done. I got stuff for you too. Don't even worry about it. (laughs) You may think Jesus had a lot to say about church leaders and he does. And we're gonna talk about them a little bit more here in just a moment. But I want to add that it's not just the church leaders Jesus talks to, the Spirit of God talks to through Ezekiel into chapter 34. Because that passage goes on when it talks about all the evil shepherds to talk about the sheep. Because guess what, folks? Sheep have some accountability too. Verse 20, therefore thus says the Lord God to them, behold, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. He says, good shepherds or bad shepherds, Sheep are still accountable to me. 
And he says, and I will set up one over them who can take care of them in the most appropriate and beautiful way. And although 500 years earlier, the crowning of King David would be a symbol of the true shepherd of the world who would arrive in the person of Jesus, who then proclaimed to all sheep who listen, I am that good shepherd. The prophecy in Ezekiel clearly speaks to two things, the dual responsibility of both the leaders and the members of the church to make this community work. In other words, you and I are responsible for our own healing. You cannot blame your lack of spiritual maturity on me. You cannot blame your lack of spiritual maturity on the dysfunctional leaders who came before you. Doesn't mean you can't point out that's dysfunctional. Doesn't mean you can't say that hurt me and my family. But you ultimately, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, are accountable to do your own work, as am I. Because every next place we go, if we don't choose to heal our grief, our expectations rise. Then any potential wounding as we walk through our spiritual life becomes deeper and deeper and deeper because the old wounds ahead of it were never healed. Allow me to clarify. We aren't responsible for the healing work itself. We are responsible to keep ourselves in the process. The Holy Spirit brings that healing work, but we are responsible to ask big, awkward questions. Like where in my church story have I been hurt and never asked for forgiveness? Where in my church story have I been hurt and never offered forgiveness? Where in my church story am I still holding on? Where in my church story, this will get kind of personal for some of you, Where in my church story do I over-worship leaders of the church and put too much responsibility on them? Where in your church story are you even? Do you know the people often at Kesed, I think, that have the most clarity about where they are in their church story are the people who are at Kesed and don't know why and don't know if there's a God because they'll be honest with me. I don't know, man. I'm just spiritually curious. I'm like, I know exactly where you are in your church story. Awesome. Let's go. It's the people who are like, I know all this. I was a Sunday school teacher for 20 years, and I'm just here because it's fun. I'm like, where is that? Where is, where is that verse where it's like, eventually, oh, Christian follower, you will get to a place where it'll just be fun. I don't think it's in here. But I think we're unaware often of the process that we're supposed to be in, and we bail on it all together, and we pause or become stagnant. The Bible might even say you become lukewarm because we're not willing to look at the places that have been hurt by the church. And so we just bring other people to connect, but we ourselves sit back and watch waiting for them to let us down once again. It's like that part of the story in the Velveteen Rabbit when the rabbit wants to become real. And he's talking to the skin horse in the nursery who's just all kinds of worn out. And he's like, I wanna be real. How do you do it? And the skin horse replies, he said, you become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or who have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. This is supposed to be a place full of people who are becoming, a place full of people who are in process, like the blind man. A man who knew nothing more than that he used to be one way and now he's a different way. He doesn't think he's complete. He's not like, well, now that I can see, my life is over. I'm pretty well settled. He's in process, and he knows it, and he knows why. I heard someone say a quote recently regarding the church. It says, reject any ideology that does not allow for the beautiful, sloppy, glorious, ugly, amazing, mean-spirited, kind, complicated mess that is humankind. The church moves inside that circle forwards and backwards constantly. This is how we become, by staying in the process. This is how we heal. 
I'm gonna get hyper personal for this next uh, section regarding some of my own healing. Um, some of you have been actually church hurt by, by people leveraging things and information like I'm about to share with you uh, to somehow set themselves apart or somehow make them different than, than others in the church. And I, I just want to preface by saying that that's not my intent at all. As a matter of fact, I wasn't going to share it at all except that it would be really disingenuous of me not to share this with you, talking about our own personal responsibility to stay in the process. Um, recently, uh, in my own personal and spiritual development, I found myself in a place that I've never consciously experienced before. Uh, in just about every area of my life, about four or five months ago, I found myself stuck. Uh, stuck in my emotional health work that I take very serious. Stuck in my parenting, which made me really sad. Um, stuck in my marriage, which sounds really bad when you say it out loud. I wasn't trying to get out or anything, but we had just sort of got to a stuck place. And especially stuck in my church leadership as this place started to grow, and I started to become concerned that uh, if I didn't figure some of my own stuff out, that I would lean into the brand that this church wants me to be in order for it to, to move to this next imaginary level. And so I was nervous that I was going to start sabotaging, which is something people do when they react to, uh, to trauma in their life. And many of you know my story, but I have a large church trauma. Uh, I like medium church because it feels more, more balanced. But as our church grows, it's, it's pushing the envelope of what I'm comfortable with. And so I got concerned about this stuck place. Uh, the skin horse might say to me that I had stopped becoming. This meant that relationally, uh, I was in a rough spot with God. And I confess, if I'm being honest, that uh, that's just because I'm a straight up punk. I really am. I, I have a lot of issues and things that I just don't want to face and that uh, I've allowed to, uh, to take up residence in my heart. But knowing I was going to have to teach some of these things to you and knowing that uh, my wife was worth this hard work along with my children, along with uh, God's kingdom, uh, I finally decided to be responsible for staying in my own healing process and I decided to stop squirming and just obey. And so I woke up uh, one morning a few weeks ago and felt that God wanted me to fast. This was a private thing. Uh, I didn't tell my wife even for the first few days because frankly, I didn't think it would last longer than just that, two, maybe three days. For those of you who don't know, uh, spiritual fasting is the practice of eliminating food for a period of time and is a biblically-based opportunity to recognize your full dependence on the Lord. Anyhow. I started my fast January 2nd, figuring it would last at the most three days. I think that's the most I had ever fasted, three, maybe four days. But as each day came and went, I didn't feel released, most likely because I'm a punk and the Lord wanted to starve the punk out of me. <laughs> this frustrated me a lot. I became very angsty that first few days. As a matter of fact, I was unkind to my wife at one point and she leaned forward really close to my face, now knowing that I was fasting, and she said to me, I swear to God, if you don't be nicer to me, I will put a piece of cheese in your mouth while you're sleeping. <laughs> Which would have broken my fast. So I was like, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And the whole point of me doing it, right, was to uh, deal with some of the stuff that sometimes made me unkind. I adopted a habit that I haven't had to use in a long time. Back in my youth pastor days, uh, I used to teach students something that, that worked for me. I would uh, buckle the, the passenger seat next to me when it was empty and tell God all the different things I thought about him. Uh, I would get frustrated with him. I uh, don't know why I thought God needed a seatbelt. It was just a way to kind of manifest that I really wanted him to be there. This particular week, I uh, drove around and told God all the different ways he was being mean to me because I was very hungry and I really wanted to just deal with whatever this issue is and move on. I'm a busy guy. Looking at my schedule, I was like, God, do you see I have a few dinners that were scheduled weeks ago? I'd like if you would just release me from fasting. Otherwise, I'll just cancel the dinners, move them out to where we're done. God was like, you'll do no such thing. You'll have all your dinners. 
and you'll just explain to people that I've asked you to fast. And I was like, cool, God, thanks for being so mean to me. Then I was like, God, you know I have a three-day family trip to the mountains in a few days. One I take every year, it's booked a full year out. At this trip, my mother brings all my favorite foods. Surely you don't want me not to engage in the family you've blessed me with, O oh Lord. Surely you want to call off this fast. If not, I'll just go ahead and move the trip a few weeks. And God laughed at me and said, you'll do no such thing. And I was like, you are the meanest. Then I was like, God, you know I have multiple messages to give for you. I can't walk on stage with this kind of countenance. I need you to release me from this. And if you don't, I'm going to get other speakers to speak for me for a few weeks so that I can fully focus on whatever it is you want to break within my spirit that I'm holding on to so much. And God was like, you'll do no such thing. You'll walk on stage and suffer through and mumble through or do whatever you think you're going to do that, that as if I need you and I'll do what I want with the room. And I was like, God, you are the biggest meaner ever. Have you ever called God a meaner before? I did. All in all, God walked with me in this way for 21 days. And the entire time I wrestled with him over the things he wanted removed from my life, some past pain, regrets, resentment, pride, a lot of pride, and on and on and on. For me, it felt like being lost in a forest fire and he was the only one who knew the way out. He was like a great devouring flame that swept through my world, slowly devouring everything that hurt me, choking the air of my self-righteous independence and self-reliance, and it did not feel good. It felt like something I learned through making sure I did a fast at this level right, what's called a healing crisis. As you normally eat, everybody in this room, your body's natural defenses use fat stores to store toxic metals and other toxins so they can't wreak havoc on your system. However, during a prolonged fast, these toxic metals and toxins are safely expelled from your body as fat reserves get used up. This cleansing effect may temporarily alter some people's complexion or cause other signs of what is known as a healing crisis, meaning if you had a flu three months ago, whatever residual effects that flu may have could be stored in your fat reserves. And if your fat reserves begin to uh, dissolve and be moved away, you could actually feel like you had the flu for six or eight hours again. During a healing crisis, you can feel even worse than before you started your detox program. The good news is that this reaction is likely a sign that you're getting better by way of a deep and thorough cleansing. Allow me just to offer, for some of you in this room, you going to church again is actually just like this. It's another version of a spiritual healing crisis, and you being here may actually cause you to feel worse than when you weren't here, although may I just say that might be the truth that it's working that you are experiencing some of those pains that the Holy Spirit wants to deal with while you sit in a room that reminds you of where you once were hurt. Enough about you, let's get back to me. As I walk through my own healing crisis, very much feeling as if I was lost in a forest fire, the one thing I did have far more than I ever knew possible was the warmth of his comfort and the light of his presence as he led me out. I've since finished my fast, and although I still feel a bit toasty, I'm also refreshed and ready for whatever he wants to do next with me, with this place, and yes, if you are willing, with you. And I'm committed to staying in the process. I'm very grateful for the, God, the time that God spent with me. I have a lot more work to do. I actually think I came out of the fast realizing I have more work to do than when I went into the fast. But I have a whole lot more peace about the fact that... Uh, that as the skin horse said, would say, I am becoming. My hope is that you can reflect on where you're at in your spiritual process, that you, can, that you can hold that space, that you can be curious about what it is God is trying to walk you through in your life right now. Now, this example that I offered only speaks to one side of today's message, the personal side. The responsibility that, that we as sheep have that we must face to embark on our own healing journey into God's community. But we still have that other side that I said we would talk about. The church leader side, which Jesus spoke to earlier, that he takes very serious. 
So here's what I'd like to do, something I've never seen done and something I don't even know will really work, but that it's been on my heart and on the heart of the pastors here at Kesed. And so I'd like to invite them up right now before you all. These are the pastors that are here in the room, minus, uh, I think we're missing Joe, who's at our student retreat, and uh, the ones that are over at Columbia. But these are the folks that are here right now. So recognizing that according to Christ, the church leadership has a responsibility to steward their responsibility and influence well as a symbolic gesture towards your heart and an invitation for you to enter into your own healing process as recognition that the church leadership of many churches that we have grown up in, that you have grown up in, and maybe even time again this one, has hurt the people that were supposed to shepherd. We, as the pastors of Kesed Church, would like to offer you our most sincere apology. Divorce is <clears throat> incredibly painful, and I've experienced that pain. And if you've gone through a season of grief and heartache at the ending of your marriage, or some other painful, forever life-changing event, and the church you attended was not willing to sit with you in your brokenness, if you were not comforted, if you were not prayed for, prayed with, if you were not encouraged, if that church was not willing to be used by God in your healing, if you were labeled or marginalized or made to feel less than, if you were victimized in any way in that season of heartbreak and grief, I am deeply sorry. And with all my heart, I apologize. I want to apologize that church has not been safe for a lot of people. It hasn't been a place for you to bring your wounds, your scars, and even your secrets. That it has not been handled with gentle gloves. I apologize that our church should be the safest place in the world, and at times it's not. And I am so sorry those things happen. I, I would like to um, apologize if you've attended a church that the kids haven't been a huge priority and that they're not seen as the gifts that they are. So, and I also want to apologize if you've ever left a church for whatever reason and you feel um, forgotten that um, I just, it, it's on my heart that I just feel, I feel terrible for that. So I'm sorry and I apologize. I, uh, <laughs> I want to apologize to all of the women here in this room and in this building today. Um, I am deeply sorry, and I stand here in the gap for that. As someone who was hurt by the church being a woman, either being too much or not enough, I am deeply, deeply sorry for any pain or hurt that any church or any church leadership has caused you or made you feel like you were not important, that you were less than, that you were used or manipulated in some way, or that your voice didn't matter. I am deeply sorry for that. Being both an elder and executive pastor here at this church, I know firsthand the responsibility is to steward well the tithes and offerings and our expenses. And we take this for that Kessel Church. At the same time, growing up in church my entire life uh, and attending other churches, I can see where money or tithes can be used as a tool of manipulation and guilt. 
you've ever experienced that, I'd like to say that I'm sorry. It's like Tom, um, I've grown up in church my whole life and uh, got into the uh, music area of church a little over 20 years ago. And to tell you, music is, music is very, very, uh, a powerful, powerful thing. Some of you don't even realize it's used in like, obviously like movies, commercials, it's being used right now as we are talking. Music moves the heart. God created that. But I am sorry for those who have used it to manipulate. To get something from you and those who use it to manipulate. I'm very sorry for that. I want to apologize for two things. One, if you have ever experienced this book in a weaponized way to make you feel less than, to make you feel unworthy, and to make you feel like you don't belong, I want to apologize for that because that is not what the words of God are supposed to do and that is not what the Word of God does. And then I want to just allow it to get even one step more personal. To think that Kesed is somehow perfect would, of course, be naive. And so I personally want to apologize for any way that this church has let you down, this church right here, for any way that this church has, has hurt you or hurt your heart. I want to say that, that I'm so very sorry for that and that my hope is you can see how much we as pastors mean it. We today are bearing witness before the Holy Spirit as, as shepherds, members of his flock, that we are supposed to be of a higher calling. And so my hope is today that there is incredible healing, that there is all kinds of great conversation at, at, at lunch after church, and that you find a space to be able to connect differently in the community God has called your church home than you ever have before. Will you please stand? And we'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we proclaim in this room right now that, that you are the great shepherd, that you are the one that brings the healing and the wholeness and the peace beyond our understanding. And so God, I pray today would be the beginning of some people moving into their process of becoming, of no longer being spiritually stagnant, of letting go of old hurts and old wounds, of realizing that that was man and not Jesus. And so Lord, may you just bring a fresh revelation into this space, allowing us to be a community exactly as you designed. We are accountable to you, Lord, as the shepherds of this particular flock. We submit to that leadership. We submit to you and you alone. May we each move into our process proclaiming you worth that glory and worth that purpose. We lift it all to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. God bless. Uh, I'll be here next week to close the series. See you then. <laughs>